get started and people will keep joining. So, so thank you everybody for coming to the seminar today. It is my pleasure to introduce Yang Liu uh, from the Department of Computer Science at uh, my former uh, institution, the University of California, Santa Cruz. So Yang and I actually interacted quite a bit when I was uh, back at UCSC. Um, Yang got his PhD from the University of Michigan and then he did a postdoc at Harvard and then uh, he went to UCSC. Uh, where he's been uh, in computers in the computer science department for what three years now, I think, um, and uh, a lot of his work is in uh, algorithmic fairness and optimization. And actually, I had kind of two different goals uh, by inviting him here to give a seminar. Uh, so one of them is that his talk serves in many ways as a technical complement for some of the material that I'm covering in the seminar uh, on data and algorithmic ethics uh, that I've been teaching this quarter. Uh, where many of our grad students are participating. So, so hopefully this will uh, provide kind of some uh, up-to-date uh, technical examples of, of the work that has been done in, in that area. And my second goal is, so, so Yang is actually involved on the UCSC side with the IFDS Institute. So IFDS is the Institute for the Foundations of Data Science. And that's an institute that just got funded by NSF. Uh, we formally started uh, in September. Uh, and one of the components of that institute focuses on responsible data science in general. And so fairness is one small component of that. So uh, I'm also trying to do a little bit of advertising for, for the work that has been done there. Um, we have people at UW uh, in computer science that works in that area. And actually one of them will be giving uh, another seminar later, later in the quarter for us. Um, and Yang. So, so if this is an area that anybody, students or faculty are interested in, uh, there are a number of opportunities here, including uh, funding. So uh, feel free to reach out to me or, or even to Yang if you want, uh, if, if you think that these are areas in which you think you have uh, an interest. So uh, thank you, Yang, for coming and please go ahead. Uh, really nice to have you around. Yeah, uh, thank you, Abel, for the introduction and uh, thank you for having me here. Um, Thank you all for joining me at this talk. So in this talk, I'm going to tell you, first of all, briefly, what, what is fair classification and why this is an important question. And then the rest of the time, I'll go through the additional challenges we have when we are having an imperfect training data. Right? And feel free to interrupt and ask questions. And I look forward to questions and discussions. So uh, as Abel said, we had, we had an interesting group here at UC Santa Cruz that works on responsible machine learning and also fairness in machine learning. And this particular talk is a combination of multiple recent works from us. And uh, especially it's based on a sequence of uh, works that tries to formalize this notion of pure loss function. So this is a new, this is a new family loss function that we discovered recently that is, that's able to first uh, learn robustly with label noise and secondly, this approach does not really require any prior knowledge of the noise rate. Okay, so the second property is really exciting to us, and this enables a immediate application of this loss function to uh, a variety of sophisticated applications. Okay. I want to thank my, all my students for contributing to this line of works. And most of them are at UC Santa Cruz right now, and uh, Hongyi is now joining Northwestern University. All right, so in short, fair classification is just trying to add a fairness guarantee to the classical classification question. And more formally, the goal here is to find a classifier H from a hypothesis space such that this H will optimize the accuracy or equivalently, this will minimize the zero one errors. And uh, simultaneously, we want this classifier to satisfy a set of fairness constraints. And let me explain these notations before I explain these constraints. So here I'm using the F to denote a fairness metric. So in practice, depending on, I was just ch chatting with uh, Yin Chain, depending on different fairness metrics you're interested in, this F can denote the true positive risk, the false positive risk, the classifier is offering to a subpopulation in the data set. All right, so technically you can, have, you can plug in any interesting or meaningful accuracy metrics as this fairness metric. 
And as I mentioned, this metric is defined for a subpopulation of group of people. And this notion of groups or this notion of subpopulation is captured by this variable Z. So in fairness in, in fairness in machine learning, we often call Z as a protective sensitive attributes. So in the case of uh, where you are concerned about the gender equalities, the different realizations of Z and Z prime can denote the, uh, the male group and female group. Or if you are sensitive about the age, like one of the group can be the young group and the other group can be the group of senior people. All right, so combine these two definitions, the uh, F subscript Z is basically the fairness metric you're achieving for this subgroup of people. All right, and then with this definition, these constraints are basically saying for all the groups you are considering and for each of the pair of groups you're picking, Z and Z prime, you want this fairness metric to be as close as possible. Okay. That's what we mean by fairness. Not hard to imagine this question, similar to this classical, cl classical classification setting, can be translated into a fair empirical risk minimization framework and can be solved by uh, accessing a set of training data. So here I'm accessing a training data set D that comes in tuples of xi, comma, yi, comma, di. So X, I, Y, I, these are the features and labels. These are standard notations in machine learning. But uh, in addition, we have the ZI to denote which group this data is coming from. Okay. And based on this information, we can really write down this empirical risk minimization question formally. So in the objective function, we are having, we are computing, we are calculating the losses across the entire training data set. But at the same time, we are computing, we can also computing, uh, the fairness metrics using this data set. And that is because we are given this information on ZI. Before I start talking about all the technical details, I just want to mention why explicitly adding this fairness, con fairness constraints is crucial and also is necessary. Okay. I want to show you a couple of examples. The first one, this is the article that was published, uh, I think four years ago, saying there's a possibility of uh, bias introduced by, introduced by machine learning. So basically there's a software that's, that is entirely a data-driven approach that predicts the future cri criminals. Okay. So the input data is a set of uh, profilings they, uh, they recorded for different defendants. And then the labels is like they track these defendants for some period of time and then decide if this defendant has recommitted crime or not. So this is the data they had. And based on this data, they are trying to build a st statistical model or a predictive model to predict how likely this defendant is going to recommit a crime. Okay. So basically this is trying to predict the chance of recidivism. And based on this prediction, they, they are going to assign a risk score to people. Okay. Presumably, if the score is lower than its threshold, they are going to offer the bail decision. Okay. Saying, okay, if your risk is, high, is lower, fail, or if the risk is higher, no bail. Okay, so that's, that's the way they're gonna use this tool. But later people find this tool of this software seems to be biasing against a certain racial group. Okay. Then people have been complaining about the use of this tool. And the company who has been maintaining this software has written a rebuttal by showing this figure, saying, hey, our scores are calibrated. So in this figure, this y-axis is the chance of recidivism, the chance of people recommitting a second crime. The x-axis is the risk score. Okay. So if you look at this score, I think you're gonna agree with the rebuttal from the company because for each of the risk score you pick and you go up, you're gonna see the chance of recidivism for different groups are roughly similar. Okay. Seems like the model is doing the right thing. However, as I'm gonna show you in this example, by calibrating the score across different population does not prevent unfair treatment. Okay. So this example that is uh, kind of synthesized from this data set. Here we have two group of people. So the blue group and the red group. The numbers below the people indicates the, the chance of recommitting a crime. So this, this is basically given by the risk scores. And the, you can think about the lower the score, the better the chance of being given, given a bail this year. And the stars on top of these figures 
indicates the true positive cases. So these are the people who didn't really recommit the crime. So these are the people sh who should be given a bail decision. Okay. And now given the risk score or given this predicted chance of recidivism, let's cut its threshold. So I think at showing the figure, let's cut at 40%. And then immediately you're going to say for the for the blue group, the false positive rate is roughly two by eight. It's twenty five percent. You miss two people with with risk of 0.3 and 0.4. Out of these eight people, you offered the bill this year. But for the red group, the false positive rate among the five people you offered the bill, two people actually um, recommit the crime. So the false positive rate here is forty percent. So in other words, one of the group here, namely the red group, is receiving 15% more favorable decisions as compared to the other group. To us, I think that's the unfairness thing happening here. Right. So there are a lot of issues that I can keep going on for another tutorial, um, but I feel like I shouldn't really waste too much time on that. Um, but there's one more thing I just want to mention. Some people had this mis misperception or this impression that by removing sensitive attributes will be sufficient to guarantee a fair treatment. And this is not the case. Okay, so people had this argument saying, hey, what if I remove genders and remove the race or I remove all, any other sensitive attributes you are interested in from the training? So effectively, my classifier never saw this information. Then how could I still be unfair? Here is another example. We, um, this is a real world example we had um, from Amazon. So Amazon was using this data-driven approach to make decisions about which area they should offer the same day delivery. So this is a favorable service that is, uh, that is enjoyed by people. But due to limited, uh, limited resources, they can only offer this service at a certain area of Boston. And Amazon claim they're not really using the race of the customers. So it's not really biasing against any group. But as you can imagine, if the model is reading the zip code or any other neighborhood information, effectively, this information are correlating with the racial information. And therefore, the trend classifier is going to treat these groups differently. Okay, so removing these attributes does not really solve this question. So for people who are interested in this literature, this has been a booming as uh, as Ching was mentioning and also fast growing literature. And there's a dedicated conference called ACM FASTAR. Uh, that is, uh, again, it's a dedicated conference for fairness re re relevant issues in machine learning. But uh, for this particular classification question, I think there are roughly two lines of approaches. The first line approach is called unconstrained approach. So the idea is like we have the constraints, but can we do some, can we do some work to, to remove the requirements of the constraints. Okay. And generally there are two ways to do so. The first is to do pre-processing. So you can think about using um, some information theoretical measures, which I'm gonna talk about later, to prune out the features or to select a subset of features that are less correlating with the sensitive attributes. Okay. So once you're pruning out these relevant features, you will be, uh, it, it will be relatively safer to train the classifier using this data. The other approach is called post-processing. So you're still gonna do this unconstrained training, but after training, you're gonna readjust the threshold you're using to, um, to readjust the classifier to satisfy the constraints. But as I mentioned to Inching, uh, Inching late, uh, earlier, this may lead to a, a randomized classifier, which is not a fearable solution in fairness. And there's another line of study that just takes this constraint optimization question directly. Okay. And there are multiple, uh, multiple ways of solving this question. And this paper I cited here has a really interesting take on using this kind of uh, no regret learning approach to model the, uh, the objective function as one player and then the constraint as another player, and then the best response to each other to converge to the optimal solution. I think this, this was an interesting read to us. So the, the setting we consider is, uh, is slightly more challenging. Okay. In practice, we are assuming, or the, the case we often have 
is when the clean data is not available. Okay. I'm gonna mention why we are interested in this case later, but uh, the, the setup is here. So instead, instead of having access to the clean training, training data, we are only having access to a noisy data set. Okay. For, here I'm denoting this data set as xi comma y tilde. So I'm highlighting y tilde using a different color to indicate that this y tilde is noisy label and can be different from the true label. Okay. So in that sense, some of these training labels are corrupted. And in order to enable this analysis, I'm following this classical error flaking model or this confusion matrix model in the literature by saying the, uh, the noisy label are generated according to these parameters. Okay. For the binary classification setting, these are captured by the two parameter E plus E minus. So E plus is basically when the ground truth label YI is positive, the chance of you observing a negative label. Okay. Similarly for E minus. So our approach in this talk uh, are, generally, uh, are generally true, uh, also generally useful for multi-class classification, but in the presentation, I'm gonna focus on the binary classification case just for easy demonstration. First, let me denote this uh, error rate or this noise rate E plus E minus as a function of Z. Okay, practically, uh, especially uh, what we observe in practice is when we are inviting people to label the images, and when the images are containing sensitive information, such as like the, the race or the gender, these are, these are effectively the factors that are correlating with people's implicit bias. So uh, that will lead to a systematic errors towards a certain group. So in practice, these E plus E minus are different for different group of people. Okay, so let's denote that. And the goal here is to perform the fair ERM, the fair empirical risk minimization using access to only this noisy data set. Okay. There's no ground truth available in any part of the training. Right. So uh, the, the cases that involves this uh, noisy training example is pretty popular, I think. For instance, like in image labeling, if still, if you go through this popular data sets, you're gonna say like, there are a lot of annotations are being wrong, okay? And also we've been working with, uh, with doctors on medical applications, this doctor diagnosis can be wrong too. As well as, well as there's, a, there's, a, there's application from our own group, we are trying to, this is government funded projects that are trying to build a machine learning classifier to predict how, how reproducible these scientific articles are. But then the labels like the labels indicating how likely the article is going to reproduce is very expensive and, and also time consuming to collect. So often we only have access to experts' opinions, which is only a noisy copy of the ground truth label. Hey Yang, it looks yes. like you have a question um, in the Q&A. Um, Alan Min is asking, do you assume that the error rates depend on X? X, great, yeah. So that's a great question. Uh, in general, so in, in, in the main results, we are assuming this error rate is independent of X. So it's only depending on the labels and the, uh, and the sensitive attributes. But we do have an extension by saying, what if the error rate is instance dependent, meaning it's dependent on X. So we have some preliminary results that is um, in the last paper here, this instance dependent, dependent label noise. But for, for, but for most of the presentation here, we are assuming this noise is independent of X. And there's another question from Marina Mela. Yeah. Uh, is the, Z, Z underscore I observed? Z I is observed. Sorry, I missed the Z I here. So Z I is observed as before. So only the, label, only the labels are noisy. So first thing I want to tell you is what are the potential harms that are introduced by the label noise? Or more formally, the question I'm interested in answering or the question I'm interested in asking is what can really go wrong if we are just pretending the labels are clean and we are just gonna plug in the noisy labels blindly into this fair ERM framework. So formally what I'm doing in this section 
is I'm going to plug in the noise label into the losses in the objective function, just by saying, okay, I'm trusting these labels are clean. As well as I'm going to use these noise labels to compute the fairness metrics. Okay. So here I'm highlighting the quantities that I'm using the wrong label to compute. So here I'm using the, uh, the red color to denote this fairness matrix. So this one is, will be computed on this noise label vacuola instead of true label because we don't have access to. And the, to, to make it easier to present, I'm just, I'm just going to call this as the perceived fairness because these are the fairness metrics you computed on this observed data. So the first thing I want to mention is, uh, again, this is not new from us, but we do keep observing these effects in our training. That is the label noise often disrupt the training of the distant boundary. This happens with synthetic data as well as with raw data. But here I'm showing you a 2D example to demonstrate what is going on here. So on the, on the left-hand side, this, uh, this is a very easy 2D classification question. The inner class is one class, the outer is another class, right? And uh, when we have the clean setting, and here we are training a two-layer neural nets with cross-entropy loss, okay? there's no noise. And you can see the discern boundaries are pretty confident, and the, this, discern, this classifier is separating these two classes very well from each other. But once you start to add this label noise, meaning by randomly flipping some data points to the wrong label, so this is in the middle figure and also in the figure on the, in the, figure on the, on the right-hand side, so in these two cases, what's really happening is the existence or the mixture of the true label and the wrong label is really confusing the classifier. And it's really confusing the training of the descent boundary. So in both of the cases, the descent boundary becomes less focused and uh, it's really the confidence of each of the region. So here I'm using different colors, the yellow, the yellow band and also the blue band to denote a certain region of prediction confidence. So these regions become much larger, meaning the predictions are no longer confident. Okay. And of course, as a consequence, the test accuracy or the test errors will start to, um, the errors will increase uh, in terms of the classification results. And the second issue is the label noise can really be decisive in terms of the guaranteed fairness constraints. And for all the things I'm going to talk about, we have proved the theorems in the paper. So feel free to read the paper. I'll ask us questions later. But here, I think I'd rather to give you detailed examples to show what is going wrong here. Okay. Again, this is a very easy 2D classification question. So if you look at the first column, we have two features, x1, x2. And each of the features takes binary values, 0, 1. Okay. So altogether, we have four cases. Uh, and we have two groups of people we are trying to protect. So we want to be fair for group A and B. The true labels of A and B for each of the cases are also listed in the first column, okay? And uh, the second column of the table documents all the training labels, all the, all the training data from group A. So in, in, this, in this case, group A has a set of clean labels. So if you really read, all 400 examples for group A are with the correct label. But now we move to the second column, the third column. Group B has about a quarter of these labels being wrong. Okay. Again, I'm denoting in red these wrong labels from the group B. Now I'm pulling all the data together. I'm having the last column. So I'm summarizing the, the, the number of labels from group, both group A and B. And then I'm gonna use this collected data to train a classifier under a fairness constraint. In this case, we are equalizing the true positive rates. Okay. So I'm denoting the outcome classifier as H star fair in the last column. Okay. Again, if you trust our training, so this is a classifier you will have, we are predicting two cases as being negative and two cases being positive. If you cross check the last column of the classifier with group A and B, you're gonna realize this classifier indeed as promised achieved equal TPR on both of these observed crop data. Okay. So if you compare this classifier with group A, out of these 200 positive examples, we are predicting half of them correctly. 
So the true positive rates, the perceived true positive rates on the crop data is 50%. Similarly, if you check on group B, out of these four cases, again, we are predicting half of them correctly. So for group B, we are also achieving 50% 50, 50 true positive rates on this cropped data. However, if you compare the, the last column, the H star fair, with the true labels that is listed in the first column, we are we, we're going to say out of these three cases for B, we are predicting two the two of the positive cases correctly, therefore achieving a two thirds of positive true positive rates. But for A, we are only predicting half the cases correctly. Okay, so this is saying even though we are achieving the equalized perceived true positive rates on the noise data, we are actually offering a uh, imbalanced true positive rates on the true distribution. And what is interesting and also what is concerning to us is the group A here is actually the innocent group because all group A's data is clean and only group B brings in the noisy data. However, on the true performance evaluation on the true labels, group B is actually enjoying a better performance. So the last harm I'm going to mention is when you combine this wrong constraints with your objective function, um, the things can be the things can become even worse. The wrong constraints can really hurt the accuracy. So this is a real experiment we did on the adult data set, which uh, this is a data set that is recording the customer's profiles. And based on these profiles, we are trying to predict the income level of each of the person in this data set. So in this case, we are interested in checking the accuracies for the female group and the male group. And uh, if you look at the right-hand side of the table, we are listing two classifiers. The first classifier is H. So H is given or H is obtained by doing nothing. So this is a very naive training. We don't do anything to fix the noise in the labels. We're just pretending the whole data set is clean. And, uh, Oh, by the way, we add we randomly or we manually add noise to the labels to make the to make the data set interesting. Okay, so we create a noisy data set upon this adult data set. So the H classifier is done by just performing the standard um, gradient descent on this cross entropy loss, no fairness constraints, no nothing. Okay, so this is the accuracy we got. But once we start adding the fairness constraints. Okay. Remember, these are the wrong constraints defined on the noisy label. This is H fair we got by adding these wrong fairness constraints. And what we observe is this false positive rates of both groups increase significantly. Okay. Both groups become much worse than, than they were before. And it, especially if you read the last, last row, the, the, overall, the overall accuracy for the male group dropped from 80% to 73%. So adding the wrong constraints can really be, can be dangerous too in terms of hurting the accuracy of the training. All right, so how do we solve this question? And in this section, I'm gonna focus on easier case when this error rate E plus E minus is homogeneous across the group. Yeah. So different groups, the male group, female group, the young group or the senior group, they have the same set of noise rate. If you have 40% um, chance of observing the wrong label for male, we are assuming we are also going to observe a noise label for the female with similar probability. So why we think this is a easier case? This is the first results we are trying to prove when we had this question. That is, if we are e equalizing the fairness matrix on the noise data, so-called this perceived fairness, how does this perceived fairness relate to the true fairness? So this, theory, this lemma is stating when we are equalizing the perceived true positive rates and the false positive rates such that, so I'm using the tilde TPR to denote this uh, noisy or perceived true positive rates. So this is the positive rates calculated on the noise labels. Okay. This is not the real part, true positive rates. But suppose we don't, we don't know this. So we are equalizing the perceived TPR, FPR between these groups. And then the true fairness gaps the difference in the true or the real true positive rates and false positive rates relates to the perceived quantities tilde TPR and tilde FPR, as well as the noise rates in the following way. Okay. 
And this proof is pretty straightforward. We just, um, it's based on very basic algebra, algebraic derivation. But what, what is interesting to us is immediately you're gonna say, equalizing the perceived TPR and FPR does not guarantee a fairness, uh, does not guarantee the equalization in the true fairness matrix. For most of the cases, these two gaps are actually going to be positive. So we formalized this statement in the paper. And, uh, and this lemma implies two things. So first of all, this is not the results we just mentioned. The perceived fairness guarantee does not imply the true fairness guarantee, all right? But uh, the good news is, however, when the error is EZ equals EZ prime, meaning the noise rates are homogeneous across groups, equalizing the perceived TPR and FPR actually suffices to guarantee the equalized TPR and FPR on the cooling distribution. Okay, that's because if you read the quantities on the right-hand side, this difference between the EZ and the EZ prime will becoming zero. So in this case, the perceived TPR or the noisy TPR can actually serve as a good approximation to the true fairness matrix. All right, so this is the good news. Because in this case, this theorem is saying we can decouple the treatment of the constraints from the treatment of the loss function. And this will allow us to focus on fixing the mistakes in the loss function. So how do we do this? Again, this is not an entirely new question to fairness in to fair classification. So this question has been mentioned and brought up in the literature. And the current solution is uh, the theoretically rigorous current solutions. I mean, there, there exist many different heuristics, but in terms of uh, theoretical guarantees, the current popular solutions are to perform loss correction or to perform label correction. Okay, so they are, they are, I think they are done in similar ways. So I'm only going to tell you how to do loss correction. The basic idea of performing loss correction for this noisy learning setting is to define an unbiased surrogate loss function to correct the errors in the label by, uh, by fixing the loss functions. Okay. So here I'm showing you one way to do this. So instead of training with this uh, losses on noisy label y tilde, we are, we are defining a loss function, which I call L tilde, such that it actually involves two losses. The first loss is a loss on the noisy label, but then we have a second loss that is computed on the opposite of this noisy label. So these two lossy ter loss terms are trying to uh, account for the fact this noisy label can be different from the true label. And then you have these different linear coefficients to balance these two terms. The details are not important, but the way of this careful um, specification is try to make sure this L tilde is unbiased. So I'm listing the equation here, meaning the expectation of L tilde is equals to the true loss. Okay. If this is satisfied, then you can perform empirical risk minimization with the summation over L tilde. And as you can imagine, when the number of data goes large, this summation is going to converge roughly to the expectation, which will be equal to the summation of the true losses. So this is the idea that, has, that people have been using. But this is a really neat idea. I mean, I really enjoyed this idea and has been applying this approach in a lot of my uh, applications. But however, this approach requires this knowledge of errors E plus E minus. Right. So in this definition, we actually need this knowledge to write down these coefficients. And that has been really bugging me for many years. Whenever I'm going to apply this approach, I'm, I need to all, I, I always need to ask myself the question, can I have an estimation approach? Uh, can I satisfy the required conditions in all this estimation approach so that I, I'll be able to estimate these quantities E plus E minus? And often these estimations will require some ground truth label, or it will require redundant multiple noisy labels to, uh, to perform inference type of uh, approaches to infer the ground truth label. And further, even if I could estimate these quantities, this noisy copies of E plus E minus introduce another layer of errors. And this often can become the bottleneck of the learning. 
And needless to say, I think this is not a friendly approach to multi-class classification because effectively you need to estimate or you need to specify the entire confusion matrix between each pair of the, each pair of the classes of labels. So for, for years, we are trying to find a function or a loss function that is, that is robust or that is responsible in this setting. And uh, also we are, we are looking for a function that does not really require this knowledge of the error rate. So it will enable a really quick application to many noisy settings. So here I'm going to introduce peer loss. And uh, before I dive into this detail, I just want to mention pure loss is not a single loss function. It's a generic idea that is covering a broad family of loss functions, which I'm going to tell you later in the slides. Um, but here I'm presenting one of them to give you the high level idea. So there are really two high level intuitions when I was trying to come up with this loss function. The first intuition is I'm going to have a loss function that is defined across multiple training samples. Okay. So this is a unique feature that distinguishes this loss function from the existing ones. So if you look at the picture, uh, the, first, the, first, the first row is the prediction, classifiers prediction on different training instances. And the second row is are the noisy labels. The typical loss function operates uh, on uh, each of these training instances separately. So I'm highlighting in this blue box. Often what you do is you pick xi, y tilde, and then you have it, you pick a loss function to evaluate how each xi predicts this y tilde. Okay. So that's often what people do in, uh, in designing the loss function. But here I'm going to, whenever I'm trying to evaluate xi, y tilde, I'm also going to draw some other samples in a proper way such that the joint evaluation will help me capture some statistics across this population. Okay. And the way I'm doing this is to randomly draw two peer samples, P1 and P2. So P1 and P2, they are drawn independently from the rest of the data set. Okay. But again, I'm not going to check on XP1 against the YP1 and XP2 against the YP2 because I'm already doing this in the summation of the losses. So I don't need to recheck, the, re recheck these pairs again. But instead, I'm going to do this weird mismatching. So I'm going to check how HXP1, the classifier's prediction on P1, predicts the noise label on P2, right? So this was a really crazy idea in the first place. It was like, why am I checking the classifier's prediction, prediction on a entirely independent and irrelevant task? But the whole intuition is I'm going to use this mismatched pair to punish over agreements. So through the years in the training, in the training, the classifier, we observe what can really, what, what really often went wrong when training with noise label is the classifier tends to overfit to the noisy, to the noisy labels. All right? So here by introducing this pair of P1, P2, I'm trying to punish the classifier from over agreeing with its noisy labels because there are two irrelevant tasks. The classifier shouldn't be predicting very well on this noisy label. And as a matter of fact, if it's actually predicting very well on these pairs, that's a signal of the classifier is over memorizing the noisy patterns in its data. So we should punish this behavior. Okay, so this is a high level intuition. So to summarize these discussions, the peer loss had the form on, on the bottom. So for each of these uh, data, data pair x i y tilde, again the first term we are checking the losses on the same example. That's as commonly done in machine learning literature. But then we are minusing the losses on different examples okay, to punish this over agreement. And notice this loss function does not really require any specification of the noise rate. And before I give you the formal guarantee, I just want to mention this uh, construction of pure loss resembles similarity to this notion of correlated agreements. So this, this, this notion was proposed in this uh, rather parallel literature called uh, economics computation. So this is a notion that's trying to uh, capture the correlation between two, source, two sources of predictions. 
you can think of one prediction, one source of prediction is the is a classifier, and then the other source of prediction is the noise label. So in this literature, the, the argument is instead of instead of capturing or instead of verifying the simple agreements by checking the joint distribution of the two predictions, you should really be checking the marginal correlation between the two predictions to kind of understand the marginal contribution of each of the prediction with respect to the other. So the formula that was given in the paper is roughly as follows. So for two predictions, Y and Y star, we are looking at the joint distribution, but also we are menacing the marginal product distribution between these two prediction sources. Okay. The second term is pretending as if these two predictions are independent. But if you check this one with the peer loss, when you take expectation of peer loss, the second term of the punishment, because of the independent sampling of PI P1 and P2, this is exactly trying to mimic the marginal product distribution here. Okay. So in some sense, peer loss is a loss uh, or a sample format of this notion of correlated agreement. Right. So we, we give a list of guarantees for this, uh, the robustness of this loss function and also the associated, uh, the associated training procedure, but here's one of them. So if we are minimizing the expected risk of pure loss over the noisy distribution. So if you read equation one, this exploitation is defined on this noisy label distribution. So nowhere we are saying the clean distribution, no access to a clean distribution and no access to the noise rate. So I'm denoting this classifier as, as H, H star peer. Okay. And the first theorem is stating if the data set is balanced, the H star peer is exactly equal to the optimal classifier as if you're minimizing over the clean distribution over the zero one loss. Okay. So this is a really strong guarantee to us. And this is true for any hypothesis space. All right. So you may ask a question, what if the data set is imbalanced? We have some other treatments or extension of pure loss to cover the case of imbalanced data set. I don't think I have time to go into the details of how to prove this, but uh, I really want to give you some high level idea of how does this magically happen? So in fact, the proof itself is not super complicated. There are mainly three steps. At the first step, we're computing the expectation of pure loss over the noise distribution. And exactly we're showing the expectation is similar to these correlate agreements. There are some terms we are checking the, uh, the joint distribution, but there's some other terms we are checking the marginal distribution between the classifier and also the noisy label. And the crucial step is a step two, where we are proving this quantity itself is a linear transformation of the true loss on the clean distribution. Right. So this quantity seems to be able to decouple the effects of the noisy noise labels with the rest of minimization. So as long as this noisy risk is becoming a linear transformation of the true risk on the clean distribution, it does, the, the noise rate E plus E minus here does not affect the minimization. Okay. The last step we're just showing like for the clean distribution, minimizing the pure loss is the same as minimizing the zero one loss and that finished the proof. The second step, this immunity to noise is the, really the crucial step to, uh, to establish. And uh, we, have, we have a sequence of extensions to make it easier to implement, uh, including we are replacing the zero one loss. So all the results I showed you earlier were defined for the zero one loss, but now we can plug in any generic calibrated loss functions. So to define this pure loss function, to define a similar loss that is in, uh, that, that is in this format. We offer risk bound and also convexities. So our analysis is kind of interesting um, by its own. So feel free to read the paper. And uh, we also have extensions to the case when the error rates are group dependent, meaning the errors are different for different groups, as well as asked earlier, what if the error rates are instance dependent, meaning they are different across different samples. So the, 
the other thing I want to mention is again, peer loss is not really uh, um, independent by itself. We later realized that there's a strong connection of peer loss, like this robust design of loss function in the setting to this notion of F divergence. So here, again, I'm showing you this equation. So earlier we argued the peer loss, the, uh, the expectation of peer loss had this format of joint distribution minus the marginal product distribution. So if I denote P as a joint distribution and Q as a marginal product distribution, I can rewrite peer loss in the following form. So it will be equal to the expectation of P over some function G that is defined on the classifier and the labels. Minus thing, or subtracting the expectation over the marginal distribution Q over a function G prime. Okay. But if I further rephrase and under some conditions, we can show that the second G prime function is equal to a conjugate function that is corresponding to some other convex functions. So this risk, this, this, this equation will be coming the expectation of the joint distribution over G minus the expectation over the marginal distribution over F star G. But then for people who are familiar with information theory, that's exactly the variational form of the F divergence. So by building this connection, we are actually able to adapt some F divergence functions to, um, to customize them into a robust loss functions. Okay, so this expand these family loss functions we are considering. All right, so, so far, uh, I think we really just use one result to decouple the handling of the constraints and the loss functions in this setting. But here, let me talk about this case with heterogeneous noise. Right. So when the, e, when the EZ is not equal to EZ prime, meaning different groups can have different uh, rates of uh, misannotation, how do we handle this case? So first of all, let me talk about the loss function again. And uh, I just want to mention when different groups have different arrays, this is really a disastrous situation for the surrogate loss function, for the surrogate loss idea, because effectively you need to estimate these parameters for each of the group. Okay. The requirement of estimation is much higher. And that really, that really concerns us if we are going to apply PR loss. But in fact, we proved now, if we are just adding a constant or a parameter to the second term of PR loss. Okay. So remember, previously I was arguing the second term is serving as a punishment of overfitting to the noisy labels. But now we're just adding a parameter alpha that regulates the degree of the punishment. Okay. And then we prove we properly set this alpha and this alpha does not need to be an exact number it can be in a range that depends on the, uh, the level of noise and also the variance of the noise. Okay. As long as you can set the alpha properly in this range, training with this alpha peer loss is going to return the optimal classifier as if you're training on the clean data. Right. And then what about constraints? Right. In this case, as I showed you earlier, the constraints are trickier because the, uh, I think I have the equation here. Yeah, because I showed you the perceived constraints, when you are equalizing the perceived fairness metrics, the true fairness gaps are not immediately zero. And uh, if the errors are different for different groups, this quantity remains positive. So that is not easy to fix. And as you can imagine, in order to fully fix the constraints, we often need to know some knowledge about the errors. So we took two approaches. First, we realized that if we do it pre-processing, that procedure will be uh, independent from the label noise. Okay. So we actually develop a information theoretical measures to prune the features. Okay. The way we do this is similar to the following. So we're gonna compute the mutual information between each of the dimensional features with the, sens with the sensory attributes. And then we're gonna rank all the features and prune out these highly correlating features. Okay. And the reason we are, derived, we are using the mutual information is because we derive bounds for the fairness, gap, fairness gaps using the mutual information. So, so the, 
this like difference in the true pass rates and false pass rates can be very well bounded by the mutual information between the features and the sensitive attributes. And this computation of the mutual information is independent of the labels. So therefore we are immune to the label noise. We also had a second approach to perform the constraint corrections. So even though I have been cr criticizing a lot of this uh, prior work on estimating the parameters, but uh, for now, let me also try to estimate one parameter here. Right. So here I'm defining this delta to denote uh, that is defined the following form, which is one minus E plus minus E minus. So this delta is roughly capturing how informative your noise label is. So if E plus E minus becomes zero, meaning there's no noise, this quantity is one. But if E plus E minus are pretty high, say they're close to 50%, the random guessing case, this quantity will become a zero. Okay. So kind of this, uh, the degree of this quantity captures how clean this data is. And suppose I can estimate this quantity. Okay. So how do we do this? So first of all, we can leverage existing techniques to estimate E plus E minus and then plug in to compute this delta Z. And I just want to mention the estimation of this delta Z will be easier to, uh, and also will be more robust as compared to uh, estimating E plus E minus separately. Because only, we only need to know this entire quantity instead of knowing the separate quantities. And in addition, we have developed a sample save approach that is showing the figure here. Um, the basic idea is like we're learning some threshold of uh, we're computing the losses of each of the examples. And then we're defining, we're dynamically tuning some threshold to filter, filter out these noisy examples. And based on the filtering, we can have a set of clean, clean data and also a set of noisy data. And then using these two sets of data, we can compute this E plus E minus as well as this delta Z. And with this knowledge, and also with the lemma we showed you earlier, we can perform constraint correction. So we are showing, we find a good approximation of the true positive rates by using the delta Z and also the perceived fairness metrics, this tilde TPR and tilde FPR. So that's how we handle the constraints. So let me give you some, uh, empirical evidences before I conclude the talk. So first, let's take a look at the descent boundary. So these are the two figures I showed you earlier. When we have the noisy labels, all the descent boundaries become less confident and less concentrated. Right? So this is a training with the cross entropy loss. But if we plug in, so we don't change anything here. So we're still training a two layer neural nets, but if we're replacing the cross entropy with pure loss, this is the descent boundary we, we obtained. Okay, so in both of the cases, the peer loss is holding up really well in terms of separating these two classes, and the, the descent boundaries are really tight. This was a surprise to us. So initially, we know peer loss is going to improve the prediction performance, but we didn't know that peer loss is also encouraging confident predictions. And uh, based on these observations, we actually went back to analysis to show in this dynamics of the training, peer loss is actually encouraging the prediction to be more confident instead of being confused. So that's the benefits of plugging in peer loss. Uh, the other curve, again, this is the training uh, we did when we are having the fairness constraints and all the, all the other things. Uh, the, the other thing we really want to avoid is like in standard setting, when you're training with noisy data, often you're gonna say the training accuracy will, will continue to increase and the model will be overfitting to the noise data. I think I explained this earlier. But here, if we are training with peer loss and also this corrected constraints, you're gonna say the training accuracy, which is in the blue curve, at the very early epochs, is going to start to decrease. So meaning peer loss is able to avoid overfitting on the training data. So as the training goes on, the training accuracy starts to decrease. But at the same time, 
the validation accuracy starts to hold and it continue to increase. This also demonstrates how um, effective peer loss is in this noisy training environment. And also we perform a set of fairness studies on uh, multiple, I think at least six or eight different data sets. And uh, we really define the protected groups based on the gender information or the age information that is recorded in the data set. On the next slide, I'm going to compare with two approaches. The first one is we call the uh, corrupted models where we don't really deal with noise. So we just plug in the noise label and do the training. We also compare with the surrogate loss, uh, surrogate loss approach where we are estimating all these error parameters and then plugging to perform this loss correction and also the constraint correction. Okay. So this is a result I'm going to go through. Um, so first of all, it should be, uh, we have multiple data sets and within each of the data sets, we have two rows. On the top, we are showing the violation that is fairness violation that is, that is achieved by the approach. And the, on the bottom, we are showing the accuracy of, uh, of the training. The first thing I want to, I want to point out is uh, for the corrupted approach, like when you're pretending the data is clean and when you're not doing anything, to handle the noise data, you are also you are often led to the case where the fairness violations is pretty high. Okay, so these are the case that in the training we are actually guaranteeing a small gap in the perceived fairness, but then we are when we are computing the fairness violation on the true data, you can say uh, in the medium column, the uh, the fairness violation for the corrupted model or corrupted method can be as high as thirteen percent. So this is the uh, arrest data set for four groups. The other thing, if you look at the next column, the surrogate loss approach looks fine on many cases. So the violation is not that high and also the accuracy is holding pretty well. But because of this, uh, the variance of estimating the parameters and because of the instability of this estimation, like for some data sets, this approach can really mess up. So for this German data set, this is a credit score data set, the uh, fairness violation is uh, almost as high as 12%. Okay. okay, so I don't want to spend time on the peer loss, but basically we do observe, even though sometimes peer loss is not the most accurate models, but the, uh, the performance is pretty consistent and pretty stable across different settings. Right. I think that's all of these technical details in this in this talk. I mainly just uh, I mainly introduced the peer loss, which is the new loss function that is that allows us to do uh, robust training with noisy environments. And also, we've been trying to incorporate the fairness constraints in the setting. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Yan. And yes, any questions for for Yan? Very insightful talk. Yeah. Any questions, I'll, I'll be here to answer or feel free to email us. Uh, let me actually go back to this thing. Yeah, we have a list of papers here. Uh, feel free to read and uh, we have the contact information in the paper. So, so actually I myself have, while others might be thinking about, so, so actually I myself have, have, have some questions. Yeah, it's very smart idea about using this peer loss. So I wonder like if when you mentioned a case that you have inhomogeneous, like a, like a heterogeneous noises cases, right? You have to add in these additional alpha values. My intuition is that this alpha value, like the feasible range of alpha probably depends on easy and easy prone, right? How different yeah. the two are. So, yeah. so, so unless you have a, so I, I assume that you probably need to use additional data to estimate mm -hmm. these two properties so that you can get a feasible range, roughly an estimated right. feasible range of alpha. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's a great question. So yes, technically or theoretically speaking, the perfect range of the alpha de uh, depends on the uh, the specific noise rate. So we have the closed form of characterization. But uh, in practice, what we do is we're gonna just use the noisy validation data to tune the alpha. And uh, it, it turns out to be working fine. But I agree with you, uh, in order to know the exact range, we actually need to know some knowledge about the, about the noise rate. Right, because I was thinking that like in my first intuition when I saw this is like, oh, well, why not let's do a cross validation and then we can tune alpha, right? But then I right, realized, right. well, 
but uh, the cross validation code itself could also be biased because if we don't know alpha, right? It's more yeah. like a chicken and egg. We need to know the alpha so that we can get unbiased. But then if we don't know, yeah. we use cross So that's kind of chicken, like a chicken and egg. Yeah. That's wonder, a chicken egg question. But the, but the issue is like, we are relaxing the alpha to be a range. Mm -hmm. So even though the valid, validation is noisy, it's mm -hmm. a, there's a possibility the validation, the validation range is overlapping with the true range. So right. as long as they're overlapping, you you'll be able to find kind of the optimal alpha from this overlap range. I think that that's kind of our intuition. We don't have the full proof, but uh, so far it, the the code works fine. So that's our conjecture. I see. Okay, great, great. Yes, yeah. Because I, I kind of also feel that you might also be doing something like iterative algorithm, right? You can also do cross validation, exactly. get that, and then you kind of repeat like a user refine alpha and then to do it, and then just iterate it until you you reach some stage. Right, right. right. That's a possibility too. Okay, other questions? And yeah, I, actually one, one uh, another th question is, yeah, it's very interesting talk. So I think, yeah, this is like, as we mentioned, this is more like a pre-processing, right? You are trying to mm -hmm. pre-process like using an additional, this peer loss. But actually I think the peer loss, this concept itself is not really constrained to the fairness, right? I think even it's like in generic case, as long as you have a corrupted data, like corrupted labels, then you can actually use this, this, this peer loss idea and, and to deal with that, right? Right, yeah. So the peer loss paper is a, was more like an independent paper <laughs> from this fairness setting. And uh, we just found this has a really nice application in the fair classification setting. But, uh, but you're right. So peer loss itself was applied in many different settings. I think we have, since, since its publication, we have been receiving a lot of attentions from uh, different applications. Like people have been applying this to say like recommendation system mm -hmm. when you're having the noisy uh, ranking from people. And ourselves have also been implementing peer loss into a reinforced learning setting or other sequential learning setting to correct this noisy observation to reward. So yeah, this, this, I feel that's why I was mentioning at the beginning. So this idea of uh, like this construction of uh, randomly pairing, I think this is a pretty generic idea that can that can be used in many different settings. Right, right, yeah. Mm -hmm. And one also one, one thing is that I, I saw that when you have this correct correcting term, it feels like actually I think this like lots of different example. I feel like it behave like a multi color approximation of like if if you just randomly pick any pairs like the y and x right. are random pair. So actually yeah. I, I feel that even you have more like when you if you can actually do this minus five like these different examples, multi, even more times than a single instance. And you just, yeah, as long as you yeah. it, I think that should still give yeah. you the same call. That's a great question. So we have, again, we have different versions of implementations. So in, uh, here I'm showing like this one pair, this independent sampling, but uh, in practice, we are trying other sampling approaches. And uh, also we are drawing multiple pairs to take the average to okay. small, to smooth out the variance. Yes, that's, that's something we can do. Yes, okay, great. Yeah. Yeah, very, very, very interesting comments. I think um, these are definitely super relevant. I think we have been thought about this too. Um, yeah, great questions. Great. Other questions for Yen? Yeah, I think most people might just be very exciting about Halloween tonight. I think tonight is like Halloween night. So yeah, we are keeping people too late here. So uh, again, thank you for here for the talk. And uh, if you have questions, feel free to email us. Okay, thank you so much, Yen and. And yes, I think that would be the talk today. Yes. Already. Okay, great to see you. Yeah, thanks yeah, for very great to see you guys. talk. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Yang. Okay, Thank you, people. See you. Okay. Happy Halloween, see you. everybody. Happy holiday, everyone. Happy holiday. <laughs>